old title of a famous, locally famous airplane named Miss Cedartown. No hands, Miller. Not good. That's unusual. When, when Beth doesn't raise her hand, or Wheezy Parker, I get plumped. She was a baby. We have uh, Dr. Have, uh, Dr. Miller Thank here, uh, who's going to share with us uh, a moment of history right here. Charles going to scream in four minutes. So we'll go. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was doing some research on uh, Major Homer Watkins trying to find his uh, obituary in the 1942 edition of Cedartown Standard. And I ran across an article I got really excited about. It was a story about the emergency landing of a twin engine bomber in Cedartown. I was nine years old at that time. And I remember being down at the uh, airport, somebody must have taken me down there, walking through a wet, cotton field and there was that twin engine bomber Frank nosed over tricycle land gear clamp and uh, you know it was just unreal world was going on big time at that time I was telling a friend of mine about this a uh, while back and he said Miller I was 10 years old at that time living in a Goodyear village and he said I saw this airplane circling and it goes along with that pilot's report he said I drugged the field so he was trying to find a place to land sure enough that plane landed down there, and this 10-year-old boy at that time was one of the first ones down there, and the crew was getting out. <laughs> Luckily, it won uh, major damage. I think the pilot said the front wheel collapsed, and the propellers dug in the ground and bent it. But the uh, Air Force people came up from Macon and said, we're going to have to disassemble this airplane and, and take it back to Macon for repairs, and it's probably going to be three or four months. Now, World War II was going on, and that was a lot of time. Somebody said, well, why don't we lengthen the runway and can we repair this thing on site? And the guy said, yeah, we can do that. So they came up for making and sure enough, in just about three weeks, the runway was completed, the airplane was ready to go. They brought a, uh, well, they named the plane Miss Cedartown, forget about that. Uh, they had a Lieutenant Armstrong was a pilot. They uh, chose to take this plane off because they weren't quite sure what was going to happen. So, Frank, they stripped the plane of all unnecessary gear, put him in 120 gallons of gasoline just to get him to Atlanta. So he flew on to Atlanta. Now, doing a little research on this story, I found out this was a DB-7B bummer. In the B designated, this was manufactured for the RL. I got real excited when I read that. I said, oh boy, Miss Cedartown, I'm sure it was going to be an invasion or a bum Monte Casino or, you know, real, real big thing. Well, I'm sorry to say that didn't happen. I sent an extra ten dollars to get a history uh, <laughs> after that. But, uh, when I got it, uh, our little airplane, uh, the only damage it did in World War II, they had to pay a Mr. West a hundred dollars for cotton damage and a hundred dollars for uh, the damage to the field. So we we just did damage the United States. In December the 28th of 1942, Miss Cedartown was condemned to the U.S. So I emailed this guy. I didn't quite understand what that meant. And it said it was sent to Muroc Air Force Base, which is now Edwards Air Force Base in California. And he wrote back said it was probably use of spare parts or so forth and so on. He suggested I write them, which I did, and got a nice uh, reply from a sergeant out there and said, I'm turning that over to our history section and uh, I'll, I'll let you know something. So we, Miss Cedartown may still be around in a, in a few parts. <laughs> <laughs> did I tell you about the, ten, the boy who was 10 years old at the time seeing the airplane <clears throat> land down there? Okay, this is the only good part. In 1953, it was 11 years later, this young man uh, had worn his wings a U.S. Air Force pilot. He was flying F-86D Sabre Jets for the 331st Fighter Interceptor Squadron in New York, and this was Coy Wilkes. <laughs> oh, I got some pictures here to report. Thank you, Billy. <clears throat> Now, where is Miss Ann? Ann, talk to us about additions to the museum. You might also make some comment on uh, the reception most recent that we had. Ann White. We, sh we should have asked Elsie to do that because it was a very nice reception. And uh, while you're here, you need to go upstairs. 
and, and look at all of the pictures of our famous musical personalities. So, but um, I have something that I'm going to hand out, and it's for museum volunteers. And so, I don't like every Wednesday and every time it's open on Sunday. I want somebody else to come. And so I'm going to give you an opportunity to sign this and you probably want to come in pairs. So <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll send this one. <laughs> but, uh, but with the Spanger fellows who were here, uh, we had um, a spectrometer. Probably Dr. Gordon's the only one who knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's before my time. But That's <laughs> okay. There is uh, one up there. Jim Weinford uh, gave this for the for the Spanger family to have a typewriter that came from his office and this equipment, and it has uh, in the. Uh, in brass, I think, his name on it. And so they came back here the next morning and said that they would take the typewriter, but they thought that since it was from his, their father's office, it should stay in the museum. And so that's that's up there to be seen. Um, I have um, a painting that's just on the table. Helen Anderson was quite talented. And she has uh, a painting of the old mill, the back side of the old mill. And uh, that we have. And there is a folder upstairs put away for somewhere we'll have to get out when we were having our reception Friday. But it's a folder about so big, and it's of paintings that Ralph Harris did. And I asked Jimmy Vincent about it, and he said, oh, he was a fine artist, and there are just many things in there that we've been given. Thank you, Anne White. That's all I have to say. Uh, a quick correction, by the, or clarification, too. Uh, last month, when I indicated that uh, the Spaniards were coming in for the purpose of uh, burying the uh, ashes of their parent, singular, uh, it, there was some uh, question as to whether both of their parents were deceased, and yes, they are. Uh, Dr. Spanger did pass away, I believe, in February, it seems like. It, it has been fairly recently. So uh, they came to interior the uh, uh, ashes of both of their parents. Well, Dr. Spanger was 99. 99. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to add a quick addition on that. I asked that since their uh, funeral home, to their uh, disappointment, did not uh, forward obituaries uh, to our local paper, uh, even though it's a little late, I asked them to be sent to us, and uh, I believe I've got them now, and uh, we'll go to the paper and we'll get them in there, because a lot of people uh, had huge respect for the Spangers, and uh, we'll do that. Carol and I had occasion to meet uh, Dr. Joe Miller and his lovely wife, uh, I, I guess a, a month ago or so. Good at picking brothers. <laughs> I think probably the uh, best intro for Dr. Miller is uh, the that which was contained in the uh, in the quarterly newsletter. He uh, is uh, as uh, extremely knowledgeable on uh, Andrew Jackson. He does, after all, have a uh, Ph.D. in history from Georgia State. He's a visiting lecturer there. He's going to talk about Andrew Jackson, uh, who was, quote, a generally unexceptional Tennessee lawyer, milita militia officer, and former U.S. Senator until he gained national renown as a military leader during the World War of 1812. I think uh, Joe Miller is someone we look forward to hearing for a couple of reasons. We've done the Trail of Tears more than once. It's the third and last of a continuing series in the uh, Indians in, the, uh, in northwest <coughs> Georgia. We always center on the Cherokees. Uh, Dr. Miller, amongst other things, I'm sure of it, is going to talk about Andrew Jackson 
and the, uh, the Creek Indians, which also were in the Northwest Georgia area. And uh, without further ado, I'd really like uh, for me to stop talking and him to get at it. So, Dr. Miller, thank you very much for coming. I don't use a, as you notice, I don't use a mic, but if you want, you can wander with that one or with that one. Well, I'm going to stick to my notes a little bit here. Uh, I feel really at home here. This is uh, uh, my sister's home or adopted home. And, of course, my mother lives here, and uh, my de late father, who uh, passed away a year ago today, uh, lived here in this town in uh, uh, the final years of his life, and uh, he really loved this town, and uh, I'm growing to uh, appreciate uh, Cedar Town a great deal myself. Uh, one of my colleagues, a uh, uh, man I've been very close to, in fact, the man who directed my dissertation, uh, Melvin Steely is the son of this town, uh, a great Ph.D. from uh, 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 Vanderbilt University. I taught at uh, University of West Georgia for many years, and uh, Melvin and I have been real close for a long, long time. Uh, I was sitting here in my chair, and I was looking around at all these pictures and thinking about how much this looked like home. This still looks just like my church in northwest Atlanta, uh, the Collins Memorial Baptist Church. I'm both same floor plan. Uh, uh, the towers had to come off of it uh, 50 years ago, but uh, it, it otherwise it looks very much like that. And the trains, uh, well, gee whiz, we were brought up, Penny and I, with the clanking of the Seaboard Coastline Railroad uh, right behind our house. Uh, uh, so much of that. And uh, this is so much like Collins Church with so many people sitting on the back row and not so many people uh, up front on the front row. Uh, and uh, the folks up here asking for contributions. I mean, a few of the preachers we had. Uh, so this is very much, very much like, uh, like home for me. And, and I appreciate you uh, having asked me to come. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a paper that I presented uh, a few years ago, back in 2003, to the Florida Association of Historians, and uh, the name of the paper was Andrew Jackson and the American Military Operations in the Mississippi Territory, Alabama, 1813 and 1814. Uh, in 1813 and 1814, the state of Alabama was a howling wilderness, an absolute wilderness as wild as anything in Bolivia today. And Americans out of Georgia, out of Tennessee, were moving that way, encroaching on Native American lands as they were on their way and going. And we had Native Americans there who were frustrated over uh, the fact that uh, Americans were coming that way, bringing their cattle, bringing their pigs, and taking over their land. And at this point, if you remember your European history, uh, Great Britain was involved with uh, a little war with Napoleon, and uh, the United States had sort of warmed up to Napoleon a little bit, getting a pretty good deal called the Louisiana Purchase for, what, $15 million at the check, and we get the American West. That was the best deal we ever got. Bought that from Napoleon himself, and the French, uh, the English at odds with each other, and we uh, were at odds with the British at this point, and the British at this point was that that nation was encouraging the Native Americans uh, to rise up against the young American Republic. And as much as the impressment of American sailors on the high seas uh, at this time uh, being the uh, precipitous uh, event that brought on the War of 1812, the British encouragement of the Native American to fight uh, against the uh, Americans coming into their frontier, the European Americans coming into their uh, frontier, uh, was a precipitous fact that brought President Madison to the point of declaring war on Great Britain. Most of us don't realize that. Um, and I opened this uh, little paper here, and I'll go through it academic style for a few pages, then I'll talk about it a little bit with you and not be so formal. On the morning of 27 March, 
1814, the American soldiers stood at the ready. Major General Andrew Jackson of the Tennessee Militia and his combined force of 3,000 state militiamen, regular army troops, and friendly Indian Confederates were poised for the attack. Encamped before them, within a horseshoe-shaped bend of the Tallapoosa River, Alabama, were about a thousand Indians of the Oak Fusky, New Yawkaw, Hillaby, Fish Pond, Eufaula towns. These were the dreaded red sticks of the Upper Creek Nation, the enemies of the United States and the allies of Spain and America's arch enemy, Great Britain. Earlier that morning, General John Coffey and the Lower Creek Chief, our ally, William McIntosh, had uh, led a group of friendly Indians across the river below the bend, generally sealing any escape routes to the Red Sticks' rear. The remainder of Jackson's force faced a massive breastworks and a batis or abatis, if you want to go French with it, type fortification that extended across the neck of the bend in the river. At about 10.30 hours, Jackson's artillery began a cannonade accompanied by small arms fire against the uh, Indian barricade. This signaled Coffee and McIntosh, who sent their friendly Indians back across the Tallapoosa in a diversionary attack against the Red Sticks' undefended rear. When Jackson saw smoke rising from the burning enemy village, he launched his main attack against the dense Indian fortifications. Amidst the feral cries of the Creeks, the regulars of the 39th Infantry Regiment, followed by a Tennessee militiamen, carried the breastwork and waded into the mass of defenders. The fighting was brutal. There was vicious hacking and hewing as tomahawks met swords and bayonets. The opposing forces asked no quarter and they gave none. Fierce combat range, raged all day as the Americans conducted a mass slaughter of the Red Stick Warriors, sparing no Indian <coughs> combatants. Jackson later wrote, it was dark before we finished killing them. As the smoke of the battle cleared from this horrific scene of carnage, the Red Stick losses were severe, 850 killed. The victorious American force had lost only 26 soldiers killed and 107 wounded, along with 23 friendly Indians killed and 47 wounded. The previous year's hideous massacre of American men, women, and children at Fort Mins, Alabama had finally been avenged and more. The Battle of Horseshoe Bend, which I've just described, decisively broke the military power of the Creeks. Only scattered and ineffectual groups of red stick warriors who escaped to the haven of Spanish Florida survived to fight another day. This victory brought Jackson fame and advancement while securing the Gulf borderlands of the young United States. This region might well have become a charnel house of American settlers if the warriors who died at Horseshoe Bend had lived to claim the huge stores of weaponry that the British were to land at Apalachicola and Pensacola within the next few weeks. It was a battle of monumental significance to the nation. And I quote, in terms of both numbers of persons killed and its importance to the war, Horseshoe Bend would have to rank high among the major battles of the War of 1812. This victory was widely reported in the newspapers and almost overnight, General Andrew Jackson became a national hero. The Daily National Intelligencer, a Washington newspaper, reported on 29 April 1814, and I quote, high praise is bestowed on the enterprise and military conduct of that commander, Jackson and even the opposition editors have reluctantly decreed to him the laurel wreath. And of course the opposition editors would have been the newspapers uh, of the Federalist Party. 
Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States, and that's, I'm going to requote what uh, our, my introducer here has said, an unexceptional Tennessee lawyer, militia officer, and former U.S. Senator until he gained national renown as a military leader during the War of 1812. His initial martial successes came in battles against the hostile Creek or Red Sticks in the Mississippi Territory, which is Alabama, during 1813 and 1814. And at least one author has called this the Creek War, America's Forgotten War. Jackson's ability to organize and sustain a combined force of state militias, regular army units, and friendly Indian Confederates was instrumental in his decisive victory over the Creeks at Corsu Bend in March of 1814. Further, in this triumph, Jackson demonstrated a mastery of military tactics and leadership that impressed officials in Washington, leading to his prompt appointment as a brevet major general in the United States Army. This military campaign was a venture that profoundly influenced Jackson's career. And that was the subject of this paper, which uh, I will not read the entire document to you. Um, Jackson attacked the uh, Red Sticks at Horseshoe Bend on 27 March of 1814. But all of this problem began much earlier than that. It began in 1813 in the summer. And this is what pretty much went down. Um, in the War of 1812, the, the British were very much in this thing, coming out of Canada, uh, landing along the Gulf Coast, uh, encouraging uh, the Creek Indians to rise up against European Americans. There was a Native American named Tecumseh, a Shawnee, who came south along with his brother, the Shaman, they called him, who uh, was very much like the, uh, uh, the ghost dance. Uh, the, the medicine men who came along and influenced later on uh, the uh, Native Americans in the late uh, 19th century uh, telling uh, the Native Americans that they rose up against the whites, that uh, they would be bulletproof. And he influenced uh, part of the Creek Nation to follow him. Uh, they were angry, the Creeks, and, and well they should have been I should think. Uh, they were being encroached upon by the whites from Georgia and from Tennessee. Uh, the Spanish, who at this point, if you remember your Napoleonic War history, were very much allied with Great Britain, and they owned the state of Florida at this point. And so they were Confederates with the British and the British <laughs> enterprise here of encouraging these Creeks to rise up against the Americans. Uh, the Red Sticks received gunpowder from the, uh, the Spaniards down at Pensacola. Uh, a group was called down there. Even one of the Red Stick shamans was along on this. And they picked up a load of uh, gunpowder, uh, which the Spaniards gave them, and were heading back up through Alabama when they had a meeting engagement with some of the Mississippi Territory uh, militia at a place called Burnt Corn. Burnt Corn the Mississippi Territorial Militia. And uh, at this point, a battle ensues. It's a, a confused battle. Um, the whites get most of the gunpowder, but the Indians avail themselves pretty well. And the whites were forced to leave the field with the gunpowder. And this inspired the Red Sticks, inspired them to do more. And what comes of this on August the 13th, 1813, is an attack on Fort Mims, which is a, a fort uh, somewhere near, down the Alabama River, uh, on the eastern side near, uh, north of Spanish Fort, uh, up around Bay Bonnet in that area, if you're familiar with your Alabama geography. And I have some 
uh, the part here uh, concerning this that I'd like to read to you here. Um, <clears throat> the following day, Fort Mims fell. Reports hold that a drunken Major Beasley, who was the commander of the fort, received adequate warning of an impending Indian assault on the fort. Tragically, he refused to accept these intelligence reports, allowing the front gate of the stockade to remain wide open. Halbert and Ball, who were two of the 19th century's best historians on the Creek War, uh, wrote this, Surely nowhere else in American history can an example be found where a fort was so poorly guarded, where a massacre was so needless. When the noon drum beat for lunch, warriors, stripped and painted black and red, rushed the gaping front gate of the fort. Groups of soldiers, friendly Indians, black slaves, and settlers grabbed weapons in a futile effort to defend the women and children. Many fought bravely that day, yet the overwhelming number of Creek warriors and the element of surprise eyewitnesses and members of the brutal uh, of the burial team, I should say, described the carnage. And I quote, every house was in flames. The loom house was broken down. The helpless inmates were butchered in the quickest manner. And blood and brains bespattered the whole earth. The children were seized by the legs and killed by batting their heads against the stockading. The women were scalped and those who were pregnant were opened while they were alive and the embryo infants let out of the womb. Some sources indicate that 500 people in the fort died during this horrible and preventable event, deaths for which Major Beasley was fully culpable. So, and Hall, uh, Hall, and Ball go on to say this, the whites had good cause to remember the Battle of Burnt Corn, while most of the Indian warriors lived not long to remember Fort Mims. Exterminating wars, perhaps sometimes needful, are ever to be dreaded. And surely no one can review this Creek War and not feel that the butchery of 500 people, commencing at midday of August 30th, 1813, by infuriated savages was perfectly needless. needless. By needless here it is meant that the commanding officer could and therefore should have prevented it. Well, my point with this is, and you wonder what the heck has he read all that for? Well, I did not read that to uh, in any way titillate you or uh, uh, in some way turn your stomachs. What I'm trying to do here is to give you a feel for how angry Andrew Jackson and the people of Tennessee were once they got word of this massacre at Fort Mims. Andrew Jackson, and of course he is the major player in this paper, and if you want to see a picture of Andrew Jackson, pull out a $20 bill. It's a darn good one right there on the front of it. And there's a reason that it's on there. He is one of the great American leaders and presidents. Uh, if you are an apologist for the Native American. Uh, if you, uh, uh, I, I can see very well how uh, people would see Jackson as being a villain in many ways. Yet what you must see is this. If you put yourselves in the place of European Americans on this very frontier where Cedartown was in 1813, Native Americans to them were savages. They were people who were very much a threat to their existence and their lives and also the goal of much of our Scots-Irish Southerners was to have land of their very own. And uh, standing in their way were these Native Americans. So, Andrew Jackson. Well, Andrew Jackson <coughs> The man who commanded the forces at that battle that culminated this whole thing uh, in 1814 in March was born in South Carolina on March 15, 1767. He was brought up on a small farm 
right on the border with North Carolina, between South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, his father died at an early age, and Jackson became a hot-tempered, wild teenager. And he quickly developed a vehement hatred, mistrust, fear, and general prejudice towards Native Americans of any ilk. From the settlers who lived nearby, Andrew Jackson gained the mindset that Indians should be moved aside or removed to make the land secure for white people to settle and farm. And I've got a quote here, another one that Robert Remini, who's the great uh, biographer of Andrew Jackson in the gosh, the last 50 years, wrote, and I think he describes Jackson quite well with this. He says, to him, Jackson, Indians were savages, and mixed bloods were half-breeds, and he always treated them like children, bloodthirsty children to be sure, whose barbarism knew no deterrent save the gun. That's the way Andrew Jackson felt. He was brought up in that manner. Uh, another group that Andrew Jackson grew to hate were the British. How convenient. As a young man, the American Revolution was going on, as you recall in 1781, Cornwallis comes in and invades the South. General Clinton sends uh, the British Army southward to try to destroy the economy of the young uh, United States. And uh, as he moves forth, uh, he has uh, one of his um, bully boys is a guy named Bannister Tarleton. And Tarleton uh, went through South Carolina uh, with a vengeance uh, against the, the settlers there, uh, releasing slaves uh, in every plantation he found. This did not make the guys on the frontier very happy. And the guys on the frontier who sided with the uh, uh, with the Patriots uh, really got the rough side of uh, of Francis uh, Bannistry Tarleton's uh, sword and Andrew Jackson at one point was captured by the British as a teenager and a British officer asked him to clean his boots or told him to clean his boots and I think Andrew Jackson let him know exactly what he could do with his boots and the uh, officer hit him across the face with his sword uh, leaving a rather large scar that Andrew Jackson saw every morning when he shaved. And so, with his hatred of Native Americans, his hatred of their allies, the British, he was the perfect man to lead the Creek War uh, in the Mississippi Territory over in Alabama. Uh, Jackson had a very difficult time with this uh, as he brought his troops southward. And I'll, I'll just go through here. The, the campaign that took place. Well, let me say one more thing about Jackson. Jackson gets a law degree. He starts a law practice in the new western part of North Carolina, which is today Tennessee, in Nashville. And um, on the way there, and while he was in Nashville, there was a great war going on, not with the Creeks in that territory, but with the Cherokee. Most of us think of the Cherokee and the, the light that we saw them in the 1830s, in the 1840s, as, as peaceful people who were trying their very best to uh, fit into the new American Republic, uh, starting their own newspapers, living in uh, dwellings that looked like ours, dressing like us, having their own newspapers and languages at New Dakota. Yet, uh, Less than a century before that, not too much less than a century, in the uh, 1790s, uh, a war went on uh, uh, between the, uh, uh, well, seven, starting in the 17, it started in 1789, uh, a, a war with the, the uh, Cherokees. And uh, it was a very brutal war. The Cherokees were great warriors. They knew their business. They knew their woods. And they fought the settlers of early part of Tennessee uh, tooth and nail for that. And that just continued to embitter Jackson. And Jackson got better and better at hunting, at hunting the Native American and at being hunted by the Native American. 
and this brought more and more animus in Jackson's heart towards Native Americans. Uh, he really loved his military duty. He loved that as a lot more than I love the insurance business a lot of days. And uh, that was the, uh, the way Jackson was as well as an attorney there in, in Nashville. And with the problems at Fort Mims, uh, the governor of Tennessee calls out the Tennessee militia, tells Andrew Jackson to take them south and uh, put these red sticks out of business. And uh, he does just that. It's not that easy, and I don't have time tonight to go into every campaign that went on just across the state line over here. But a great battle uh, ensued there uh, at a place called uh, Talladega, which most of you know. In Alabama it's pronounced Talladega, I think, but uh, a lot of us call it Talladega, I think. Um, let's see here. In any case, Georgia also responded to this call to fight the Cherokees. And this is something that most of us don't know. That a man named John Floyd, county up the road, named, uh, named for him General John Floyd of St. Mary's, Georgia, down in Camden County, was the commander and officer of this Georgia militia force that moved forth uh, under the direction of Governor Mitchell uh, and Governor Early, uh, one after the other. And of course, we've got a Mitchell in an Early County, too, do we not? Any of you Georgia folks? And uh, all of you are, I hope. And uh, in any case, uh, Governor Mitchell called out 2,000 to 3,000 men, and General Floyd took them across the Chattahoochee River, which was like crossing into no man's land at that time and into this howling wilderness called Alabama. Today it was the Tennessee Terri or the Mississippi Territory at that time and built Fort Mitchell. If any of you are ever go through uh, Columbus, cross the bridge there, turn left going to Destin, I'm sure lots of you have, uh, you'll see Fort Mitchell on the left, uh, historic site as you move down there. And this was the mustering site of the uh, uh, Georgia militia uh, in the battles that it fought against the uh, Red Sticks in that part of the world. Uh, General Floyd is wounded and uh, he misses his rendezvous with uh, the Tennessee militia, fights a couple of battles himself and, and in the end is called back, the Georgia militia is called back in that we were afraid that the Royal Navy was landing Marines along the uh, coast of Georgia and the governor called Floyd and the Georgia boys back to defend the, the Georgia coast for something that never happened. So that's a little bit of interesting Georgia history that went on there. Most of us don't even know that the Georgia militia was involved in the Creek War. Uh, it certainly was. And uh, some guys uh, really paid the price down there in southern Alabama for this. Uh, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend Ironically, and I was talking to Tom about this before we came in, and is rather near Alexander City, Alabama, where your great fountain is being restored uh, in that town, but the foundry there. Um, and so most of these battles the, uh, were fought in this war uh, through Alabama in late 1813, 18, 18, and the early part of 1814, uh, gosh, within 100 miles or so of Cedartown, Georgia. So I think this does apply uh, to your historical interests here with the club. Um, and I should go on here and say a few more things. Uh, the Battle of Talladega, no November uh, 1813. Uh, there was a battle before that on 3 November at Tallustahatchee. The Battle of Tallustahatchee. And at that point uh, Andrew Jackson picks up a uh, baby whose mother has been killed, hands it to a soldier and says, get on your horse and take this baby back to my Rachel uh, at the Hermitage uh, in Nashville. And she raised that child. And uh, uh, Andrew Jackson uh, was always proud of the fact that he had saved that baby and, and he, was, he was very large on this, 
that the Red Sticks had slaughtered women and children at Fort Mims and the United States Army and the militia were not going to do that. Sometimes it got out of hand. Uh, if you read the um, history or the, the biography of Davy Crockett, uh, Sam Houston, both of them were with uh, Andrew Jackson down at Horseshoe Bend. And, uh, and Davy Crockett was just absolutely appalled at uh, what he had done with the Native Americans as far as the killing of them uh, along with, uh, uh, with Jackson there. Uh, Jackson asked no quarter and he gave none. Uh, he was into the business of revenge and uh, he certainly got the revenge for Fort Mims uh, at Tallusahatchee, at Talladega, and then the final great victory at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Um, it's very interesting that the Battle of Horseshoe Bend comes uh, not too long before the Hartford Convention was held by the Federalist Party up in Connecticut uh, when they were getting ready to pull out of the United States, New England, and go back to Mother England and abandon the United States. It was Jackson's victory at Horseshoe Bend that pretty much put an end to the Hartford Convention and those seditious Yankees up there who were going to pull out of the United States and go back to Great Britain. Ah, well, I think I'll end this thing up here. And I know I don't want to bore you guys with this. It, this is, uh, I thought, a pretty interesting paper. Uh, and I really enjoyed writing it and, and doing the, uh, the, the research for it. But I'll close with this. The massacre at Fort Mims of, in August of 1813 had inflamed the entire nation, especially the peoples of Georgia and Tennessee. The ambitious former U.S. Senator, Judge, and Militia of Major General Andrew Jackson was incensed at that Indian depredation, exacerbating his long-held and general animus toward almost all Native Americans. The state of Georgia made a well-intentioned and sincere effort to aid in the American prosecution of the Creek War. Yet General John Floyd and his Georgia Army met with logistical impediments that limited their ability to be of much aid to the bellwether of, Ameri of the American offensive, which was Andrew Jackson and his Tennessee Army. Without Jackson and his persistent pursuit of the Red Sticks, the Creek War would have certainly lasted a great deal longer and may have spelled death and disaster to American settlers in America's Gulf borderlands. Considering the British naval and military operations that ensued in the next few weeks at Mobile and in the next few months at New Orleans, within the next few months, I should say, after the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, the lack of a decisive American victory against the Red Sticks might have uh, provided an opening for Indian-assisted British incursions into the very heart of the United States. Jackson's capture of the Spanish uh, East Florida town of Pensacola, which came after Horseshoe Bend, on 7 November 1814 effectively ended Spanish assistance and influence among the Creeks and proved that Britain would not aid Spain against the Americans. On 22 May 1814, Congress appointed Andrew Jackson, a brigadier of the line of regulars, commanding the 7th Military District. Within days, he became a full Major General. His national popularity, especially among land-hungry Westerners, which was us out here, rose to unprecedented heights. Not since George Washington had a military officer gained such universal renown. That fame only grew after his victory over the British at New Orleans later that year. An editorial in Washington City's Daily National Intelligencer exemplified Jackson's popularity. Over the fatuated savage foe on our southern border, from the first to the last, appeared to have produced in this part of the country a very general impression of the bravery of our regulars, volunteers, and militia of Tennessee and Georgia. 
this opinion has perhaps been more decisively expressed in regard to Jackson's late victory at Horseshoe Bend than any other. Unquote. That was from the newspaper uh, contemporary that day. Without Jackson's victory at Horseshoe Bend, which effectively put an end to the Red Stick faction of the Creek Nation, there would have been no Major General Andrew Jackson, United States Army. Without that intrepid officer commanding at the Battle of New Orleans in December of 1814, that victory may well never materialized. Finally, without the great fame and recognition he gained in defeating the British from behind those fabled cotton bales on the Mississippi levee, Andrew Jackson would have never been the seventh president of the United States. So, thank you. I've enjoyed speaking. That was great. Uh, we would like very much if you could make available a copy of your paper for our records. Could you do that? Sure. I'll, I'll give it a ride.